how many producers does it take to change a light bulb? Change it yourself, it's faster. One of the first things I remember when I came out of the coma was Jason Fleming sitting on the end of my bed holding a bacon sandwich. <laughs> Get that down you lance, see you'll be alright, have a bacon sunny. <laughs> and I was like, have I died? Am I in heaven? Is this like, is this what heaven is? He's the one that I can absolutely say 2000% has always had my back, both on and off set. And actually, if it wasn't for him, I would have been dead a long time ago. I found out all these other horror stories about people that had worked with these guys. One guy tried to kill himself, another one's in a mental institution, gripped my hand and uh, said to me, um, I'm not scared anymore. So glad you came back, I'm not scared anymore. She passed away two days later and the operation didn't work. And, and this chat box opens up and this guy says, mate, I've listened to your story. Trust me, you need to come here. So they took 2.1 million of the budget of that film for basically doing nothing. And uh, the worst thing about that whole experience was that one of the people that screwed us over was one of my own guys. These two characters kiss. And then we heard later that it was kind of improvised on the day. It was not in the script. Now, I have to say again, I don't know if that's true. It might have been in the script. But if it was in the script, then the writing was poor because there was nothing to suggest it was coming at any other point. One of the things that I find frustrating is there's this real trend now. You're not allowed to write about certain things because you're not from that background. Trust no one. Always have a contract. Get the contract you know, read by a lawyer. I did not stop until I had the script finished. I think I wrote straight for about something like 14 hours. I'll never forget this. Jason sent me an email and he said, Lance, you are the Houdini of script writers. I've met people like that, I've worked with people like that, and I've been fucked over by people like that. Eight different producers who have different visions for the screenplay. You've got a director who has another vision for the screenplay. And then you've probably got an A-list actor attached who also mm -hmm. wants certain scenes rewritten and keeps rewriting their dialogue. I wouldn't have stayed in the industry if I hadn't loved what I do so much. Hi, I'm Andrei Rogozin and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is an award-winning playwright, scriptwriter, novelist, director, Lance Nielsen. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be here. Look, I did quite some reading about you. <laughs> yeah, the Wikipedia page on me is, is quite quite big. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it seems like you've had quite a life. Yeah. And I think today we I want to talk obviously about like about your craft, about writing, about directing. Uh, sure. And your methods and how you and why why you do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm still asking myself that question. <laughs> and I would want to talk to you about just about your life. So I might get quite emotional, but we'll, we'll see how we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all good, it's all good. Let's start from the beginning, like your, your childhood. How did you get into, into the world of writing and then just creative? I think the segue for me was probably, I was always quite a creative kid, but the, the segue for me was definitely being taken to the movies. And there are two films that immediately come to mind that kind of had an impact on me wanting to create things because I, I would go to, the go to the cinema and then I would come back and I would try and recreate my favourite scenes from that movie, usually action scenes with all my toy soldiers and my Lego and whatever else I could incorporate. Uh, and sort of reenact those scenes, you know, like kids do when they, they play with toys. Uh, and the, the two films that I remember going back and doing that, like immediately after I'd seen the movie, was the James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. And I like recreated the inside of the super tanker with that big fight where all the prisoners break out and you've got the submarines, one of the best action sequences ever filmed for a movie ever. And then um, the other one was the Star Wars trench attack scene. And I was like building the trench out of Lego and building, you know, X-Wings out of Lego and TIE Fighters out of Lego. They must have looked really crude. This is very long time before Star Wars Lego was ever available. I don't think <laughs> Lego Space, I think, came out around the same time. 
So, um, yeah, that was a, that was kind of the catalyst. You know, I'd go to movies and then I'd try and recreate these things at home. And then um, my mother was a ballerina, my father was a graphic designer, so I came from quite a creative background. Uh, once I got taken to see a play at the theatre, I was I was caught the acting bug. Started acting qu quite young, but my parents didn't want me to go into that as a profession. They they actually did everything they could to steer me away from that. I actually wish I'd gone full pelt yeah. with that um, properly young and I wish they had supported me because I think um, I think I would have done all right at it because um, I know what I'm doing with acting and I'm, I'm pretty good at it um, even though that's not my main vocation but I think it really helps with the directing plus I'm an acting coach so I, I need yeah. to know a lot about the disciplines of acting in order to either coach somebody on a scene or direct them in a scene so um, Actor directors are often pretty good directors. I'm never an advocate of um, an actor directing themselves in a scene. I think that's a terrible discipline mm -hmm. um, because you 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 need someone else's eye on it. Yeah, um, you, you know you've got to park your ego there. I mean, it, it can work because I mean you know Mel Gibson, Braveheart, but th then that, those will be circumstances where someone has surrounded themselves with a team of the best experts available with quite a big budget. So when you've got that kind of infra infrastructure in place, sometimes it can work, Clint Eastwood being another good example. And he was one of the first actor directors, actually. He was one of the first to sort of... Switch the lanes. You know, kind of really be the captain of his, his own projects. Um, and hey, it's worked out pretty well for him. I'm mm. a big, big fan of Clint. Yeah. But yeah, but coming back to how you got into the writing as well. So uh, I was a bit of an avid reader when I was young, novels and things. One of the first novels I remember reading was The Hobbit and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So I got quite into sort of fantasy and I was a bit, a bit geeky and I played like Dungeons and Dragons and I was always creating m maps and worlds and things. In fact, I've got one of them in a folder behind me mm. that I made when I was a kid and um, found it like years later. I, so, have, I have one of those as well. <laughs> yeah, so that got me into, I wanted to write novels um, and I, I used to write fantasy novels, you know, orcs and goblins and all that kind of thing in, in school exercise books. And I had a stack of exercise books like this high with these, these kind of stories. But I didn't come back to writing novels until much later, we can talk about that later. But but that that got me started. Um, I wrote my first play in 1996, quite a bit later. And uh, I think I just wanted to create. And um, I'd done a film, I'd done a feature film in the mid 90s, uh, which, you know, you're shooting on video because you can't afford film. So we were shooting on like SVHS, the quality of <laughs> which was very poor. I don't even think that the film, I don't even think I can play the film on any existing digital format today. It just doesn't transfer. How, what, was, what, what year was it? 96? Uh, no, I shot my first feature in, this period is all quite hazy for mm. me because I lost a big chunk of my memory, but it was sometime in the mid 90s. How would you edit it? It was edited with two machines. It was, uh, you know, two tapes, uh. two tape decks. Um, sounds so clunky now when you, but you know, and you had to edit in, in order, linear. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you made a mistake, you, you, that could replicate seven or eight mistakes. And you, you, you if you, every time you try to correct it, it could, it was a proper <laughs> nightmare. But, um, I remember sitting in that edit suite in, I think it was in Nottingham University for hours, nights, night upon night upon night. This lovely woman whose name I can't remember sorted out that I got free access to it and without that free access that film never would have been completed. I, I can't imagine it, it would be quite expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that part of my life, sort of the 90s uh, up to about 2004, is uh, very, very fuzzy because mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I had a brain hemorrhage and part of my memory got destroyed and that was that happened in 2004 so all the years seven or eight years before that 
Um, like there's a play that I directed in my portfolio that I have no memory of directing. Wow. <laughs> so um, I, lots of people have told me things about it and you, you kind of get flashes occasionally, but it's, yeah, there's a big scar in my, in my brain where, um, part, where my sort of the part of the brain that has your memory, all your memories, there's a big scar there. And so a load of them just got like wiped basically. Does yeah. it ever come back or it's just... Uh, quite completely. I, it's difficult to know because you're not really sure f for that period what's real and what isn't. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I don't just really don't remember much. I get it's mainly mainly what I know is because of what people have told me. I've asked questions, um, and I've got a couple of diaries from way back as well. One of which I turned into a book. So that uh, turning that into a book was part of the exercise of trying to reconstruct some past memories mm. but I uh, you know now of course I'm at the age as well where memories begin to fade so uh, this was more of an issue for me in the immediate aftermath mm. of it happening um, it's not really an issue for me now when you go through all this and you lose your memories and then you start reading your diary and just reading things that you don't remember how how does it feel well actually I didn't read that diary until last year Oh, okay. Uh, because that, that was a diary from 1988, uh, which got got turned into this book, hmm. now available on Amazon. And um, You will have a link in the description. There you go. This is one of the few years where I kept a diary at, like entry every day. And um, that's hmm. the real one. Yeah. Uh, I found it in a box. And... Um, it was quite re weird reading it because uh, it was like reading, um, you know, I mean, keep in mind I was a teenager. Um, my childhood is all still fairly clear to me. It was more the 10 year, the decade before I was in hospital. So from 94 to 2004 is, there's very little of that time I can remember. Um, back further than that, I can remember quite a bit. So, um, so most of that, that, that's 1988, so most of that stuff came back. I don't have any diaries from the 90s, so I, I think I did, but I've obviously lost them. So, so you started with like creating the worlds for the board games, right? Yeah, I used to sort of design and make board games when I was a teenager. I ran a, a sort of Dungeons & Dragons campaign, mm. which was called The Prophecy of the Witch King. And... Um, they're not like witches like you would imagine in traditional you know, broomstick and pointy hat. It was, a, <laughs> it was a kingdom where basically witches were like sort of sorcerers. Um, they were like the kings and the players were caught up in all of that. I thought it was kind of a cool story and I, I was going to write it into th three books. But as I got older and when I finally went into novel writing, the fantasy market is so saturated and there are so many fantasy writers out there that are just way better at world building and, and all of that than I am. I, I wanted something much more fresh and original for my first novel and that was how the Diamonds in the Sky novel came about and I decided to, to have my first stab at that. Uh, when a film project that I was working on went under or kind of got put on pause. Um, and uh, by this time, people were self-publishing books onto Amazon. And I thought, well, you know what? It's on my bucket list to write a book. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to write that book. And I already had the story. I came up with the story one on one holiday in Italy, wrote a load of notes. And then three years later, I was writing it. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote that first draft in about six to eight weeks. Something no, like that. that's quick. <laughs> yeah, I was I was on fire. I was yeah. writing about eighteen pages a day. But have you had like a proper, you know, plan for everything, or you just wrote like from the beginning till the end, or did you like did you properly know what's <coughs> happening in the book? Uh, it, it's a series. Yeah. Uh, it, the first book is set in the first forty-eight hours of two hundred alien ships arrive on the Earth, and um, so I kind of was writing it with my storyteller's hat on, but also trying to market it with my producer's hat on and, and trying to just kind of make sure that the, the story was representative of how the earth is now. Yeah. 
And so it's a multi-character narrative. It's basically, you know, I saw what George R. R. Martin did with a Game of Thrones book, which is, you know, each chapter is a different person. And I, I thought, yeah, I'd like to do, write a book like that. And it's a series of books and the first two are out. And the third one should have been out in 2022, but because I was going through so many personal things in my life, I just, you know, writing a novel is, is, is a real challenge and you've got to be in the right headspace and you've got to be in it, you know, and I, I just wasn't, I wasn't there. I've got a, a ton of notes written for book three, but I just mm. haven't got there yet. But um, yes, I did plan it out. Um, I wrote extensive notes on each character that I wanted but I also kept the process organic. And as I was writing, I came up with certain ideas um, that I'd just be like, great, yeah, let, I'm gonna do that. And some characters that I thought were gonna be more prominent became secondary and vice versa. So it was a very organic, interesting and new process for me. And I, I, I like doing things that are way out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I deliberately wrote loads of characters in cultures that I was completely unfamiliar with. So I spent a long time researching those cultures, you know, and some of these are cultures that, you know, they're not available on Google Earth Street View. You can't go and wander <laughs> around a town in the middle of the deserts of Chad because no Google car has been there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I set one of the storylines in like one of the most remote towns in the world. Um, and I found out everything about the town and the people that lived there and looked at interviews and pictures and the best piece of advice I ever had from an author, um, this really famous guy who writes loads of thrillers, they, he, he drops them like two or three a year. He said, if you can write what you've written in 200 words, in two words, say it in two. Mm -hmm. And actually that's a really good piece of advice for both a new novelist and a script writer. Brevity is key. But it's very hard to, to cut the stuff that you wrote? It's got easier as I've got older because I'm a lot less precious than I used mm. to be. So I'm, I'm quite brutal now. But you started with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you started with writing for theatre, right? You wrote for screen, you wrote for, for stage, and you wrote novels. Yeah. How different is the process and just in general writing for all those three different medias? There are some disciplines or rules that I think apply to all three which is research the subject, understand the story, understand the story beats, brevity is key. And that will vary depending on whether you're writing something that's purely fictional or like 90% of the plays I've done, I think I've done 15 now, um, are usually drama-based true stories about a topic of social injustice or set within Political and social arenas, topics that interest me that I want to learn about personally and then I want to convey the facts of that narrative to the theatre going audience. And if I use my most recent play as an example, I've um, got the brochure here, uh, False Accounts, which was about the post office scandal. So, I mean, that's the um, biggest miscarriage of justice in British history, right? Um, so um, I, I started researching this as a topic for a potential play in 2009, mm. but didn't do the play until 2022 mm. because it kept changing and evolving and more about the story kept coming out. So that project got like postponed and rewritten like a huge number of times. Um, because I kept thinking there's more to this story. So that's the research and that applies to everything. So another thing that applies to all three uh, writing uh, genres, yeah. be it a play, film or a novel, um, is, is the work ethic. Um, I try and write um, a certain amount of pages per day and I try and do a minimum number of hours per day. I will tend to work in blocks of four hours and the best block is always the first one. So as soon as I get up, uh, um, I'll normally do that, that first block straight away before I eat or anything. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not set in stone, but that's uh, typically. The second block of four hours, which I'll do sort of after lunch, will we'll we'll normally focus on doing rewrites on the first block. Hmm. So, so to, to perfect that. 
and then if I'm really working hard or I'm, or I'm on a roll, I'll do another block and, and that, that block will be late at night before I go to bed and that can be, I'm a bit of a night owl so that can, sometimes that can be from midnight till three in the morning. You're usually quite tired by then but one of the good things about that, that, that period of the day or morning if you like is uh, you don't get any people disturbing you, you don't get phone calls, you don't get <laughs> important emails that you suddenly need to respond to. Writers are really good at, one of the, the, the best things we're good at is finding excuses not to write. Oh, let me just check my email, let me just check my Facebook, I'll just go on Twitter, and then before you know it, half the day's gone and you haven't actually achieved anything. I, I, you know, when I'm at my best, I, I can, I'll write anywhere between five to 22 pages a day. Um, 22 pages is my top end for a wow. script. My, my <laughs> typical number will be between six and eight, but when I've been under pressure, like I was with this job where I was, I didn't have a script, this producer, Nicola Gregory, came to me and said, have you got a comedy, something that could be set in Bollywood? And um, I said, well, when do you need it? And this, is, this conversation took place on a Friday afternoon, and she said, Wednesday, I'm having a pitch meeting with the production company, and I'm going to submit them three scripts, and like and a full, not a treatment, like no, a full script. Full script. They're going to read them on the Wednesday, right? Uh -huh. And um, and I said, well, what does it pay? And she said, ten grand. And at the time, I was proper in the shit. Um, things weren't going very well. We were under a, me and my then partner were under a lot of financial pressures. But it's Friday, and she needs the script Wednesday. And I said, right, okay. Um, you'll have a script by Tuesday. And I couldn't actually do any work on Saturday because on Saturday I had a social commitment and I was going out. So I got up early on Sunday. I started work on about, about nine o'clock on Sunday morning. I didn't put tools down until 2 a.m. on Sunday night. Uh, in that day, I wrote 45 pages. That is... It was just... It was just... It, the, the story in my head was so clear, I could type it as fast as... I could write it as fast as I could type it. So there was no moment of what's in this scene. I just knew immediately. Yeah, by Tuesday morning, I had done the second draft of the whole thing. Uh, and after all that, they read through the scripts on the Wednesday. They, they said mine was the best but they picked a different one because mine had too many locations. And the only reason it had too many locations was because the producer told me, can you try and include a scene in a hotel because there's a hotel they want to yeah. sponsor it. Can you try and set part of it in Dubai because they think there's funding in Dubai and then part of it could be in India. So I was like, cool. So I incorporated all of that. Mm -hmm. um, they could have come back to me and said, we like the story. Can you set it all in a house? And yeah, I, I would have yeah. gone, yeah, no problem. Like, Give me one day. <laughs> <laughs> so that script is still sitting on that PC. It hasn't been optioned. It's one of the best scripts I've ever written. <laughs> um, really beautiful kind of rom-com with a nice message at its heart. Totally out of my comfort zone. Um, I had to research all the culture, the food. I mean, I knew a fair bit about it already because I've got lots of friends from Indian and Pakistani backgrounds. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I in, in, in those three days, I completely immersed myself in it. Every time I was writing a scene and, uh, you know, what food are they serving? I'd be straight onto Google. Where is, what's the traditional dish in this town? What are they likely to serve for lunch? You know, what would this person wear? All of that kind of stuff. So I, I had like a mood board of pictures everywhere and loads of pages open, dozens of pages open on Wikipedia. And, <laughs> um, and again, what I liked about writing that script was it was completely out of my comfort zone. I'd never written a Bollywood-esque film before. In lockdown, I had 20 actors read that because in lockdown, loads of people came and read scripts of mine on Zoom and I had an all-Asian cast mm. come in and read it apart from the two roles for kind of Westerners. I think there's a butler, sort of butler character and one other. And the, one of the biggest compliments I ever got paid as a writer was this Asian and Indian and Pakistani cast, they, they were very mixed, they were from all over, were all saying to me, I can't believe you wrote this. This just reads like it was a, written by a local writer from Bollywood. Yeah. Can't believe that you wrote this, Lance. It's so, you know, 
it's so authentic it's so good and it's so like the stuff we make yeah one of the things that i find frustrating is there's this real trend now that you know you you can't you're not allowed to write about certain things because you're not from that background or as a 50 year old white man you know i'm told i can't write about certain things now one of the things that i wrote at the encouragement of my ex-partner who was ugandan was the true story of this plane crash in africa where this african football team were were killed and they kind of 10 years later the the the, uh, the country rallies and wins the african cup of nations which is a really big deal in africa and we were watching that match we were actually out in africa and we were watching that match happen and um we just watched a film called we are marshall which is about a similar story uh, with matthew mcconaughey good film and I, I remember turning to my then partner and saying oh god i'd love to write a film like that and she said, you need to write a movie about the Zambian copper bullets. And I'm like, who are the Zambian copper bullets? And uh, so I went and researched it and I wrote that script. And that was another one that we, we, we did in lockdown. Um, I think that the, the, the point about being a good writer is part of your job is to immerse yourself in the world that you're writing about um, in the same way that an actor actor's job is to immerse themselves in the in the world and make their character believable their performance believable you know a writer's job is to do the same thing and make the writing authentic and i like writing about stuff that's out of my comfort zone that's that's different from my own culture i just see that's part of my job and in fact that's a joyful part of the job um learning and researching and and even visiting those places and being with those people and understanding those culture uh, those cultures is is sort of vital to the writing process for me for creating characters and I do it when and wherever I can and I have such an eclectic mix of friends from all over the world different races nationality sexuality all of that all different political views and ideologies and that's that's what makes you a good writer the ability to slip into shoes and write about stuff that you maybe previously you didn't know about like you need to be authentic you need to do your research you need to understand what you're writing about that's important i think but yeah yeah and i mean i also you know as a writer i'm quite happy to collaborate i have co-written stuff with people before mm -hmm. um and i don't have a problem doing it uh you know if somebody says oh well, we would like you to write that film would you mind if we brought in a a zambian writer to to work on your version of the script with you Absolutely. Yes, please. Let's make it even, you know, please point out the things to me where it can be better. I'm quite, I think I'm, you know, maybe when I was in my twenties, I probably would, oh, it's my, my scripts, leave it alone. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm past the point of ego. I'm, I'm quite happy to park the ego and say, yes, if this is going to make the project better, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Every, every writing project is different. Sometimes you're left alone and you go away in a room and, you know, you, you come back with a script two weeks later. Other times it's a much more, more slower back and forth. So final thought on what, what's, what's the biggest difference for you between, I, I would say maybe like, no, like writing a novel and writing something for actors for, you know, play or screen. Writing a novel is a much more solitary experience because no one's going to get to read it until you get to the end of it. You and can, even you, you then can, sometimes. Yeah. And I mean, and, and you may never finish it or, um, so it's a, it's a, the gratification of it is, is long in coming. Um, you have to be very committed as a writer, make sure you do a certain number of pages a day. Even if those pages are crap, just get on the computer and write something. And you don't have to write the chapter you're working on now. If that you're struggling with that chapter, write chapter 20. If chapter 20 is clearer in your head, write that. But um, with writing a dialogue scene, um, I, write, I find writing dialogue and script scenes very easy. Um, if I'm writing it as a job for someone else, giving them exactly what they, they want takes, depending on how well you know them and whether you've collaborated with them before, takes a little bit longer. But getting the first draft out of that, that, that first scene for me is, is, is really fast because I just apply basic writing rules. You know, who's in the scene? 
um, what's happening in the scene in the scene why does it happen where does the scene take place and as the writer um, having a grasp of the narrative, whether it's a short film, whether it's a scene for someone's showreel, or whether it's one scene of 30 in a feature film script, you should be able to answer all four of those questions immediately. Mm. And uh, the, the two most important questions are, what happens in the scene and why does it happen? And if you can't answer why does this scene happen? Why is this scene important to the story? What information does it impart to the audience? What does it tell us about the characters? What does it tell us about the narrative? Uh, if you can't answer that question, that scene probably doesn't need to be in your book, play or film. Um, but, but in terms of scripts, I find answering those questions very easy. It's actually quite a fact, factual process mm -hmm. for me. Um, but when you're the worst experience is when you're working with someone who it could be a group of people who have conflicting ideas over what they want for this project. Um, and I worked with um, some people with this recently and I was getting conflicting information from different people of this three man team on almost a daily basis. And, <laughs> I, you, uh, and I, well, I, I sort of, in the end, I didn't complete the project. I mean, I wrote a first draft script for them for almost no money. Mm -hmm and then sort of started doing rewrites. It all just kind of fell apart because I just, the information was constantly mm -hmm. conflicting. And I'm sure that's what a lot of writers experience in Hollywood. That, so, you know, imagine that on the bottom end of the scale. I was able to walk away from that project fairly easily. Imagine if you're working on a project in Hollywood where you've got eight different producers who have different visions for the screenplay. You've got a director who has another vision for the screenplay. And then you've probably got an A-list actor attached who also mm -hmm. wants certain scenes rewritten and keeps rewriting their dialogue. Um, you know, uh, there's that common thing that writers are, the low, they're treated as the lowliest of the low in, in Hollywood. And that's true. You're, you're, all the material you churn out is almost dispensable. If, unless you're Quentin Tarantino and you have that power no, this is what I've written. This is what's going in the scene. This is what you're going to say. You're going to say this line exactly as written. Actors love coming in and changing their lines, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes there are good reasons for that because the project takes a different turn or actors bring something to the character that the writer and the director hadn't thought of. But it's definitely a discussion. It's, it's not a, I'm going to change this. Mm -hmm. um, because I think actors have to remember... The writer isn't coming on set and telling you how to act those lines. They're trusting you to do that because you're the actor in the same context that you're, um, you know, trusting that the writer's written good dialogue. Presumably you've attached to the project and you've agreed to do the project because the dialogue is good. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, ideal world. Because as I understand, like, there's this series, this is, you know, TV series, this is writer's media. Films is director's media, as they say, and theater is actor's media. And uh, very often when they film the series, writers are right there all the time. But if it's, if it's like the film, yeah. it's feature film, very often like it's, it's taken from the writer, it goes to the director, producer, whatever, and then no one even talks to the writer, <laughs> even when they change something. Do you think it's, it, should, it should change in a way? I think... I think it varies from project to project. I, I don't think any one of those genres has its own rigid rules anymore. It, it used to. I mean, theatre is probably the safest one. Theatre is, you know, if you're doing Shakespeare and you're working for the Royal Shakespeare Company and they're saying, we're doing this in the traditional, we're not putting any modernisms in, the script is sacred, that's it. Uh, and you might also be doing a play You've got, a, um, uh, let's say you're doing To Kill a Mockingbird. Hmm. Well, unless the people that hold the rights to To Kill a Mockingbird have given you permission to change a line because um, they will be selling you the rights to perform that play on the basis that the play will be written as intended by the author who is no longer with us. Um, so that's when stuff gets 
performed as written. But, you know, then you could look at something like Queen, We Will, we Will Rock You, the musical written by Ben Elton. They were constantly updating that, that show with little jokes that were relevant to things that were happening at the time. And I actually thought that was great. I saw it about seven times and there was always something new in it. And that worked for that kind of show. Hmm. But a, a good example of something, people changing things, or I don't think it worked, um, is the recent season of House of, Dra House of the Dragon, season two. Mm. And I'm going on secondhand information here, so don't take anything I say here as completely verbatim. But there is, I don't know if you watch the show. Mm, the second season, not yet, but okay. you can spoil it. If you well, well, well this, <laughs> isn't, this isn't a major spoiler. <laughs> yeah. um, but on the whole, the second season was quite good, on the whole. And I know that they weren't even sure if the second season was going to be the last when they started filming. So there was a lot of rewriting going on as it was happening. And, you know, they weren't sure what the ending for season two was going to be. And then, then a lot of stuff that was going to be at the end of season two got bumped to season three where they knew the budget was going to be bigger because then that got greenlit. A whole load of things happened. So you can imagine all the dynamics that that creates uh, for writing scripts. But two of the act actresses on the show, one who plays a queen and the other one who plays her kind of advisor, I am told... Um, decided to improvise and have these two characters kiss mm. at this particular moment in a particular scene. I think it's in like episode five. And apparently that was a decision that they went with on the day. And um, I was like, it came out of nowhere in all the other previous episodes and all the other scenes they'd done. There was no dialogue, nor was there anything in the performances with these people that suggested there was any kind of romantic or sexual tension between them or, an, or, or or the law of attraction. There just wasn't any attraction chemistry there. It was a master-servant relationship in the context of the story. Um, maybe there was something that was a little bit paternal, but there was nothing beyond that. So when this kiss happened, I remember us all talking about it because we were reviewing this show on a regular basis on my U YouTube channel every week, and we we were all like, and we were being very complimentary about this show. We love it. The writing on the whole is exceptionally good. I need to say that. Exceptionally good show. And we were like, did that kiss feel like right to you? Where did that come from? Mm. And then we heard later that it was kind of improvised on the day. It was not in the script. Now, I have to say again, I don't know if that's true. It might have been in the script. But if it was in the script, then the writing was poor because there was nothing to suggest it was coming at any other point. And... Here's the rub. The episode after, with the next scene with these characters, it's like it never happened. <laughs> so if maybe they shot those scenes out of sequence, mm. which is why there's nothing in the follow-up scene, but there's not even a like a little sort of, you know, deaf touching of the fingers when no one's looking mm. or a look to suggest that there's flirtation going on between them. There was nothing there. There was no romantic chemistry, nothing between these so that, for me, is an example, if it's true, again, second-hand information, I was not on the set, if it's true that these people improvised that on the day, the showrunner and also the person who was on script should have said, no, this is not going to work because there's nothing to suggest this in any of the other scenes we've done. It's not in any of the scripts going forward that you two have a romantic mm -hmm. connection You'll see when you watch it, it just doesn't work, in my opinion. Um, now, it might be that there's a big plot point because one of these characters is kind of like a witch. Yeah. So it might be that there's a plot point that's coming up where this will be explained or justified later. I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. No. I think, I think uh, the writing is not that poor on this show. I think that, that they made a choice and it was a mistake to leave mm. it in. So, Just to be clear, despite that criticism of the show, for me, House of the Dragon is one of the best shows on television at the minute, and I can see that they're trying quite hard, not altogether successfully, but, but they're trying very hard not to make the same mistakes that Game of Thrones seasons seven and eight made. And we could have a whole other conversation about uh, it, I, but yeah, let's not. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> so, I don't mind season seven, but season eight is... I, yeah, let's, let's not get into this dark, dark, dark night. Se season... <laughs> We want to rush off and make Star Wars 8. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you know what? Let's get back to you. So uh, you were so you were writing mostly like plays in the beginning, right? Well, I mean, like you were yeah. shooting something yourself, then you were like writing plays. I, I did. I did one low budget film on SVHS that no one's ever seen. Mm. Um, about three friends, and one of them passes away. Loosely based on a true story, something that happened to me in my teenage years. Um, and then when I moved back to London, I think it was in 97, again, this is all quite hazy, but um, I did my first play, which was Waiting for Hillsborough, about the Hillsborough football disaster. And then I was based at the Jackson's Lane Theatre in North London. And while I was based there, I did two plays a year for about four years, roughly. Again, this time period is all very hazy. Um, uh, because theatre was more accessible for me because mm. people were still shooting on film in the late 90s and early 2000s. Digital didn't really take off uh, digital filmmaking until sort of, I think, around the, in its infancy, 2007. The first DSLRs came out around sort of 2008, I think. Um, and then people realised, hey, you know, we can use a DSLR to not just record a little bit of video footage, but actually this video footage is pretty good. I think I can shoot a movie on this DS DSLR. You know, indie filmmakers were very quick to to pick up on this. So I started looking at making films again around 2009, 2010. I've lost count of the number of projects I've been involved in that haven't happened. Mm. And David McGifford, who I interviewed on my YouTube channel, who's the first AD on Back to the Future, uh, all three of them, He's worked on about 150, 200 films. And he said exactly the same thing on the interview. He said, I could list five times as many films that I was attached to as the first AD to shoot that got cancelled 48 hours before filming started because the funding fell apart. And then I had to go and um, rush off and find work on another movie. So I always wanted to make films, but filmmaking just wasn't really possible. Um, unless you got loads of money from somewhere for the indie scene until it became digital. When it became digital, I was like, right, okay, let's uh, see what we can do here. And mm. that led to the making of The Journey, which we shot in Greece. You said that Greece is a country that saved your life? Yeah, that's absolutely 200% true. And did The Journey come out of this? It did. Back in 2004, five, again, memory's a bit vague. I became friends with um, a woman uh, called Angela Thomas and uh, we met on the set of The Martianess Disaster, which was a TV movie that was being made that's never seen the light of day. It's never been broadcast in the UK. And um, I had an acting role in it because I'd done the play about The Martianess and uh, I decided, why not? I was still doing a bit of acting. I auditioned. I, got, I nailed the audition. I got the part. And I already knew who Angela was because she was friends of a friend of mine who worked on a show, TV show called Bad Girls. And I'd always wanted to talk to her. She just seemed really interesting to me. She had this really captivating look, really tall, striking black woman with the most beautiful eyes you've ever seen, like a panther. And um, I went straight up to her and said, hi, I'm Lance. Um, you worked on Bad Girls. You know my friend, blah, blah. I can tell you and I are going to be best friends. I, I think that was my opening line. And she sort of looked at me like, who is this guy? And, uh, and, and sort of Angela was quite a closed book to people she didn't know. And I just said to her, okay, well, I can see that I'm going to have to start this conversation. So um, <laughs> uh, I just went, I'll tell you something interesting about myself. I'm adopted and um, I didn't meet my real parents until such and such. And my dad actually was a TV presenter and my mother was from South Africa. And she went, you're adopted. And I was like, yeah, I'm adopted. That was it. We were off. Like, you know, then we, we spent the whole of the rest of that evening talking about that. And then it was a couple of years later, we reconnected on MySpace. And um, she told me she had a play that she wanted to, uh, an idea for something she wanted to write. And, and um, she wasn't sure if it was a play or a novel. Um, and, I, and, I, and she wanted to book me for a writing session. We'd been to the, we, she became like a cinema buddy. We used to go to cinema together. Anyway, this is a long winded story, but um, 
We were halfway through writing the play about that when she had a brain aneurysm. She was rushed into hospital. Um, this was a few weeks after my mother had passed away in 2009. And um, I'd never really met any, I hadn't met any of Angela's friends, even though I've been hanging out with her quite a lot. It was, uh, her friendship with me was very compartmentalized. And um, I've been ringing and ringing her phone because we were supposed to go and see one of the Harry Potter films together and somebody who had her phone called me and told me she was in this hospital in Romford. I was down there like a shot. And um, it was so weird. When I was in the waiting room, there were all these friends of hers and everyone was like, who's that guy? Who's that guy? You know, no one had ever met me before. Anyway, I went in to, to, to see her and I was in there for about, uh, probably about two hours. And uh, I was the last person to leave. By this time, I was very much in love with this woman, but I had come out of a relationship at the beginning of 2009. Me and Angela's friendship was kind of building. So I thought this is worth taking time on. You know, I don't want to balls this up. Uh, let's sort of get to know each other. There'll be time for the romance later because we told each other we had a really big, this play, this book for her was very personal. It was to do with sexual abuse in African families. It was gonna ruffle a lot of feathers and it was, you know, what she told me was a really horrific story about her childhood. And um, uh, when I was in the hospital with her, um, she was due to have an operation the following day. She had this big swelling on her brain, but she was conscious and everything. And, um, uh, you know, I was telling her all my best jokes and all this kind of stuff and just trying to keep her like laughing. And I never forget this. She sort of gripped my hand and she gripped it really tight, you know, even though she was really weak. Anyway, I left, I left the hospital. I got to the bus stop. And I thought there was, there was a time in the past where this other friend of mine had died and I'd not really told them how I felt about them. And I suddenly remembered that. And that was from that whole time where I'd really forgotten everything. But I suddenly remembered it when I was at that bus stop in that moment. That all suddenly came back to me. And I was like, fuck this. I went back into the hospital. Visiting hours were closed. And as the gods would have it, as Zeus determined, um, a nurse came out of the electronic door to that ward just as I got there. And um, she was busy. She was off like a shot. And I managed to put my hand in, lock the door, went in. It was really quiet because by this time it was about nine o'clock in the evening. All you could hear in, in the ward, and there was only about six people in there because it was an intensive care ward with the blips of the machines behind all the, the curtains. And I came and I sat in next to her and um, uh, she sort of opened her eyes and said, oh, so I thought you'd gone. And I, I um, was like, oh yeah, no, I've, I've got to tell you something. And, uh, and this scene is, is in the movie. And um, at the end of that conversation, she grips, gripped my hand and uh, said to me, um, I'm not scared anymore. So glad you came back, I'm not scared anymore. I remember it as, as clear as like it was yesterday. She passed away two days later. The operation didn't work. and all this. So she passed away on the Friday. And on the Sunday afternoon, I got another call that my dad's twin brother in um, Denmark, who a very uncle moans, very close uncle, the fun, the fun uncle. He had also died. My dad was in hospital with he was in a home with dementia at this time. I just lost my mother. I'd also lost my aunt. My aunt passed away a week after my mum. So it was this sudden like boom, 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 you know? And um, I was on in Sunday. I don't know if you remember those old Yahoo chat rooms. Do you remember them? No, you know, when, I when, don't. <laughs> when Yahoo chat first started, before people all had these sophisticated mobiles and texting was still in its infancy, you had all these chat rooms on your desktop. And if you were signed into Yahoo chat, all these different chat rooms, they were about some, some of them were about different topics. And I was, I had like a bottle of 
vodka next to my computer that had been there for about two years. Mm. I used to use it when I came back from the dentist to like sort of like almost medicinal. And I was knocking shots back at this vodka because I really wasn't a big drinker and um, drunk out of my mind in this chat room, pouring my heart out about all this shit that had happened. And this chat box opens up and this guy says, I'm typing to you sitting in a hammock on this island called a Gistri in this hotel. And he said, mate, I've listened to your story. Trust me, you need to come here. And again, to cut a long story short, within three days, I was on that island in that hotel, hmm. having never thought about going to Greece before in my life. The, the story of me getting there is a whole other adventure, but you know, wondering who that guy was to this day, you know, I'd love to meet that, that person, uh, you know, I'm, to this day, I don't know who they are. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and that's when I met Rosie and Nondas who ran the hotel and I met Shirin, uh, who was there with her husband who, uh, socks and she would later be in the movie. And some years later I would make the journey and the journey was about three men going to Greece, each of them having lost somebody. One of those characters was loosely based on my narrative. And the thing that they had in common was that none of them were planning on coming back. It was like their final journey. But the thing that they also have in common is each of them, and this happened to me on that trip, each of them meets somebody who's going through their own thing. And the good part of who they are um, still comforts that person or, or, or advises that person somehow. Um, and enables that person to move forward. And by offering that act of kindness, they're also helping to heal themselves. And I think the core message of the movie, um, and it's not a commercial film, you know, it's, uh, but, but the people that like it really do respond to it. Um, the core message of the movie is even when you're going through the worst shit imaginable, if you still have a good heart, the best part of who you are can probably still help somebody else who's going through something even worse than you. Um, and on that, that trip, the real trip, um, I met a woman who was going through a very difficult, toxic divorce from her Greek ex-husband. She'd moved to Greece to be with this guy. Her life hadn't worked out. And she became quite attached to me. I remember when I told her I was leaving, she was really quite upset. And we used, to, we had like three lunches together. We, 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 we did We spent one day out together. She was about 15 years older than me, probably. I can't remember her name, but, but she became a character in the movie. And that was sort of my characters, the character based on me is a character called Jason in the film. That was the part I originally wrote for Jason Fleming. Um, that narrative was, was, this guy's friendship with that woman. And then each of the other guys had their own storyline and somebody they met that they helped and so on. So, yeah. So that's the film I ended up making four years later. 2013 was when we started it. Um, 2014 was when it had its premiere. I, I have watched it yesterday, so it's very fresh in my memory. Oh, you've seen the whole film? Yes. I did. Oh, wow. Uh, and okay. it's, it's, I really quite enjoyed it. And you can watch oh, it on you. YouTube. So yeah, you, you can. go on YouTube and just find it and watch it. Well, the, the, the whole thing I wanted to achieve with the movie was to... It was made specifically for people that were going through something similar. People that lose someone. We're all going to lose people. That's the cycle of life, you know. But... Um, when you lose a friend before their time, somebody you feel like they've been robbed from you. I knew loads of people who had very unique and, and difficult, complex experiences, that, experiences of their own of, of grief, especially when it was with someone who goes before their time, someone who you're not expecting, someone who dies young. And I didn't have any grand aspirations that this film would make everything all right for them. But I had a small aspiration that if somebody who was going through something like that and watched this movie, 
they would come to the end of it believing they were not alone. And that was the main takeaway I wanted them to have, that they were not alone. And that also somehow the spirits of the people that we've lost are sort of somehow they're there, they're there, they're watching over them. I'm not a big believer in organized religion, but I am quite a spiritual guy. I've experienced things, spiritual things that I can't explain with science. So um, I do believe that somehow the people that we care about that we've lost somehow are, are, are watching over us, you know, and I've had several examples, including one that happened just a couple of days ago, um, where Angela is, you know, still occasionally poking her, her head in and reminding me that she's still about and keeping an eye on me. Um, you know, so, but the funding question, I think the total amount of money I spent on it was about 55 grand and I haven't seen a single penny of that back. That's a lot of money. And, and <clears throat> yeah, I, I kind of put 20 aside to work on that movie. Um, and the expectation was that that would be matched. But the producers that I had on it were of a mixed bag, shall we say. Some of them were good, some of them weren't good. But the one thing that they all had in common was none of them raised any money, actual money. Mm -hmm. um, now, a producer's job, as I see it, is one is to support the production in any way possible to make it run smoother Two, get loads of shit for free and then three raise finance for the production and number three is really the most important one um we didn't achieve number three but we had a lot of help on the first two so you know so the film happened and the, the film had a lot of problems i mean the film was originally just about jason the character of jason the other two guys weren't in the movie Mm. and halfway we did two shoots a year apart and and as we were coming up to do the second shoot that actor got cast in the london production of 24 mm. and even though he could probably have wangled it it all just became very complicated and we were all booked hotels booked flights booked all ready to go and suddenly realized we weren't going to be able to make this happen and i screamed out loud oh my god i'm going to have to make this film from, from scratch with someone else and then I let that sit, sink in for a sec and I went, I've got it. And I jumped on the edit suite. I looked at the assemble of all the scenes we had. I got on the computer. This is another one of those days. I started writing and I remember on this occasion, I did not stop until I had the script finished. I think I wrote straight for about something like 14 hours. Mm. I remember my then partner like bringing me food you know, almost feeding it in my mouth while I was <laughs> typing. And I, I sent it over to Jason Fleming, who was producer on the movie, and um, said, what do you think of this? And um, what I did was I split the main character into three people, and I wrote storylines around the footage that we had with these other characters. And, and then I came up with this great idea for a twist, which was to have two timelines that you didn't, you didn't realize there were two timelines until the end of the movie. And um, at the time, that twist hadn't been done before. It's been done loads of times now, but at the, <laughs> back back then in 2014, you, you hadn't really seen that. Um, and uh, I'll never forget this. Jason sent me an email and he said, Lance, you are the Houdini of script writers. <laughs> well done. And th that was it. And we went and made that movie instead of the original script. So, you know, it is what it is. It's It's a bit discombobulated it's a bit of a choppy narrative but i finished it probably give it six out of ten myself i'm quite self-critical uh but the people that have enjoyed it have responded to it we had a great premiere and it was one of the proudest nights of my life but mainly because i felt for me it was all about doing something right by angela really giving people a sense of who she was and how important she could be uh, in someone's life and, and you know for someone to then go and make a film about their direct experience with losing that person and ploughing three years and quite a bit of money into it mm. goes to show you how how high I held her uh, in, in regard she was a truly truly unique individual I, I'm, I'm glad that me and her 
never became romantically involved because uh, for all I know that may not have worked and, and we may, you know, it could have been one of those relationships that, you, you know, you date for a year, it doesn't happen, it ends acrimoniously, you never speak again. I mean, I don't have too many of those, but um, in, it, that's kept our friendship in this pure bubble of, of the special, unique thing that it was. And it will always be, that, that will always be what it was, the, the, the most special, unique friend I ever met um, and I've got a lot of special unique friends but she was on a level all of her own and and you know any of her friends her good friends will tell you the same thing um, about her you know so yeah so that's the mm. that's the story of the journey there you mm. go. and Jason Fleming still was in the movie because uh, he was so an actor called Donald Logue Uh, this was supposed to also be the first movie Donald and I worked on together. Nikki and Mooka Bird was supposed to be on it as well. I had this quite well-known cast lined up. But, you know, they were all doing it as a favour. And um, But then suddenly we started losing people. We lost Donald and we'd already lost Jason playing Jason. So when we lost Donald, I said to Jason, can you come in and play um, Ozzy? Instead, we, originally that character was Australian and we, we just decided to dump that idea mm. um, and have let Jason play him any way he wanted. And um, Jason and I have been best friends since, I think we first met, I think in um, the year 2000, I think it was. And um, I can't tell you the story behind how we met because we'll be here another hour, but, <laughs> but we met, we became pretty close friends quite quickly And I started writing stuff for him straight away. And at, at the time, he'd only done Lock, Stock and a couple of other films, but I'd already seen him in a, a quite a significant role that he did before Lock, Stock, where he was playing the new boyfriend of this woman and he was beating up her son and, and you know, punching the son and she didn't know. It was quite an interesting film. Uh, so he was already on my radar. He was already, oh, this actor's quite interesting. I like this actor. You know, you don't know where you are with him. Um, and then he did an amazing film with Anthony Sher, the late, great Anthony Sher that almost no one's seen, called Alive and Kicking. After I saw that movie, that was it. I was like, got to work with this guy. And then I bumped into him at a film screening and we hit it off. And it's weird, there's a lot of connections between us. Like my, um, the son of my godparents, Justin, went to college with Jason. Mm and actually took all these photographs of him in black and white. And, oh, you're friends with Jason Fleming. Oh, I did all these shots for him. When I was younger, I didn't know you knew him. And he was sending, me them, sending them to Jason saying, do you remember these? So every, every time I wrote a script from that point onwards, there was always a part in it for Jason if, there, if it was appropriate. And 90% of the time it was. And, um, you know, uh, um, after the, 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 the brain hemorrhage thing, when I, I was in intensive care for about um, six weeks and um, they put me under for, uh, in a coma for a, quite a while, you know, uh, to try and get the swelling in my brain to go down. It was a bit of a hazy time, but I know I was in hospital for about three months. Mm. And uh, one of the first things I remember when I came out of the coma was Jason Fleming sitting on the end of my bed going, holding a bacon sandwich. Okay. Get that down, you lance. See, you'll be all right. Have a bacon and sarnie. And I was like, have I died? Am I in heaven? Is this like, is this what heaven is? Jason Fleming offering bacon sandwiches. Um, and uh, that was quite early on. And he came to see me, see me in hospital about three times, I think, over that period. And when I came out, I remember thinking, fuck, I, I, you know, I need to do a will in case I, I nearly died. I need to do a will. And that's when I started thinking about the, 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 the most precious asset that I have as a person because I don't own any property, um, you know, uh, and th things like that. I don't have stocks and shares or whatever. Um, it was really my work. You know, I've got so many scripts that I've written that have never been produced. I've got all my books. I've got all my plays. You know, who owns copyright to all these things? And um, I, I would... By this time, Jason and I were pretty close, and there are not many people in the industry because this industry is really vicious. You, you know, number one lesson trust no one, right? If I'm going to give a piece of advice to other filmmakers out there, trust no one. Always have a contract, get the contract, you know, read by a lawyer. 
um, you know, a different lawyer from the people you're working with, um, or, you know, trust no one. But Jason Fleming, I would and have trust with my life, absolutely 2,000%. And um, he's also one of the most giving people in the industry. He has done probably over 100 independent films that have paid him nothing that really probably didn't benefit his career, including mine, um, that he had no reason to do whatsoever. And, um, but he did them because he cares and he, he cares about the industry and he likes giving something back. I mean, he might get knocked if I mention this, but I'll mention it anyway. I don't think it's a secret. He does loads of work for the Samaritans. He mans the phone for the Samaritans and he, uh, during the lockdown he was doing uh, God knows how many shifts of that a week. Him and his wife, they cook food and they take it down to homeless shelters. He does this kind of stuff all the time. Um, you know, I've never met an individual like him. He's not only one of the most talented British actors that we have, and I'm so glad he's not gone to Hollywood because he doesn't like the fakeness over there. He doesn't like it. He's an authentic person. So he doesn't fit in that unauthentic bubble. That's not who he is. Um, thank God, you know. Um, but he's one of the most caring individuals. You know, when I've had him on set, he'll think nothing about picking up a broom and, 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 or picking up a box. Mm and helping us shift some kit. Um, you know, you, you know, the cast and crew will go to a restaurant at the end of a day's filming. Jason's done this on five occasions, and I'll go up to pay the bill, and he's already paid it. You know, um, don't worry about it, Lance. He's sorted. Sorted. I've sorted it, Lance, don't I? Um, stuff like that. And, and um, there's been more than one occasion where I've been on my knees financially, and he's like, Lance, I, I've sent you a, a treatment. I've sent you a script or something. Um, there's a couple of K in it for you. Uh, do this for me and do that for me. And da 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 da. And uh, I think half the time he doesn't really need me to do these things. He's just, you know, got me a paid gig on something he's involved in or whatever. So um, I, I would say, of all the people I've worked with in the industry, He's the one that I can absolutely say 2,000% has always had my back, both on and off set. Mm. And actually, if it wasn't for him, I would have been dead a long time ago. He's, he's literally, in the same way that Greece, that trip to Greece saved my life, Jason Fleming has saved my life literally on more than one occasion. Um, you know, I had some real mental health struggles in 2021, 2022 went through some very bad and dark times and he was on the end of the phone. Like, you know, sometimes all hours, um, always checking on me. You know, if I was in a bad place and I left him a message, he was always the first person to call, to call me back. Really, we live in, we live in a, a, a really weird time, right? Where we're more connected and we have better communication and immediate communication with each other than we've ever had before in the history of the world. Yet for some reason, it's harder than ever for people than to pick up the phone and make a phone call. And it's quite funny, it's like when you call people out the blue to say hi, they're almost like offended now because everybody's so used to sort of texting and, and what's up, you know, Hey, hey, you know, what's up? How you doing? And all this. Sometimes I actually want to speak to a person. Mm. I mean, maybe I'm just old fashioned. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, the journey is all about people making human contact with each other. That's what the film's about. It's about human connection and about how human connection helps people to heal, helps people through difficult times. Um, you know, a man who's got no friends is going to, lead a very lonely life. My biggest fear in life is um, the end of my life will be the same as my father's. My father died in a nursing home, choking on his food with no family around him, right? I, I, I visited him that day. I took him out for lunch that day. But when he died, he died on his own in a home surrounded by strangers. Ideally, we would all 
like not to have passed under those circumstances. That is my biggest fear in life. Somebody asked me, it's that, to end up like my dad. Uh, what I do have is a lot of close friends and Jason Fleming and one or two others are the ones that will be there for me in a heartbeat when I need them. And I'm extremely, extremely lucky to have those people in my life. But at the same time, try not to take them for granted because I know how busy they are and how they've got their own challenges they're dealing with and their own life issues. Um, so it is a weird time. We live in this weird time of communication is very easy, yet somehow very hard. I think we also have a lot of distractions. On, on, on yeah. Like two clicks of a mouse, I can, I can watch whatever show, whatever TV show, whatever reality show I want, like just like that. And it's so easy to switch off from the from the real life. Like I, I know I'm guilty of it myself. I know that like I have friends who are texting me more often than I text them just because I kind of like, I'm just getting drowned in my problems and my yeah. own kind of mental you know, health problems and then and then suddenly you feel lonely and like why are you there are people just text them why do you wait for them to text that's my i i yeah. know that i can do that i know i do that and we always we feel guilty about inconveniencing people mm -hmm. you know you, you you don't want to be a burden to people yeah. i have that guilt issue quite quite a lot segueing this subject rather neatly more on topic i'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll say this about filmmaking um, yeah. and what we've just talked about um in a um, an ideal world, a filmmaker makes his film, probably takes it to a few festivals, um, puts it on the um, screen, and every filmmaker wants their viewer to come into the cinema, watch their movie from beginning to end with their phone off, no distractions, and come out and have experienced a journey that the filmmaker wanted them to take. Their reaction to it, of course, will, will be different with any, any individual. That was the cinema going experience in the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s. That is not the cinema experience of today. Um, cinemas are closing all over. Uh, going to see a film where someone doesn't get their phone out in the audience at least once, which is really, really fucking distracting, because as soon as you see that phone light over there, you're out the movie because you're thinking, shit, that person's on their phone. Now I've just missed that line of dialogue. What happened? So I try and go to the cinema either when it's completely packed, uh, which is very rare now, only happens for like event movies, like Guardians of the Galaxy or something, on, on an opening night, where if somebody pulls their phone out, 20 people, myself included, will say, oi, Belend, put your phone away <laughs> uh, before the movie starts, you know. And I mean, the cinemas do try and address this, but I mean, they're useless at it. So, um, or I try and go when there's no one there. So, you know, but watching a film or watching a TV show is such a transient, transient experience with so many distractions. And the audience today, under 30, the way they look at films is completely different to how you and I looked at films, watched films, absorbed films and processed stories when we were that age. You, you'd be surprised how many people watch a movie on their phone for the first time. No filmmaker wants someone to watch a film for their first time on their phone. I want you to see the glorious shots of the journey on the mountains and all the rest of it on the biggest screen possible, or at least on your, your Big Mac at home, or you know, connect your computer to your widescreen telly, watch it there, you know, put YouTube on the big telly, the home cinema system. Don't watch my movie on your phone. But I've got no control whatsoever of that viewing experience. So we have completely, as filmmakers, we have completely lost control of the viewing experience. And you just have to accept that. And the way that your films are going to be watched and absorbed um, and how they're going to impact and affect people is not quite the same route for most people. Um, you know, than it was for us when we were younger, unfortunately. And I'm afraid that's just the way it is. We can't help that. Culture has changed. How people watch and see content has changed. Streaming has had a massive impact on it. Streaming has devalued stuff. The, 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 uh, Matthew Holmes, uh, film director, put this really well in an interview recently. The horse has truly bolted from the barn before they thought about it. Yeah. You know, if your film is available for streaming, 
you've devalued that movie because buying a physical copy of it, that market is, is now a collector's market. Um, a lot of films aren't ever coming out on Blu-ray or DVD anymore, mm. you know, uh, which is a shame. I'm a big believer in physical media. So it's not just the way that we communicate that has changed, but, but that technology of communication has also bled over into the way we absorb and watch and digest stories. And that's also changed the emotional impact that, that stories have on us. I mean, the upside of, of these changes is that you know, I mean, I can't imagine when I was at college, I went to Epsom School of Art and Design, was on an audio-visual design course. You know, we had one camera and everyone was fighting over it, you know, to book it. There was one edit suite, you know, that you, like, I remember the second years had, had the edit suite pretty much fully booked for the first year. So we as first years couldn't even get into mm. it, you know. Um, so uh, now everyone's got a camera. Everyone's got the lenses that... Um, you know, we used to shoot The Godfather on their phone right there. And they've also got an edit suite that can edit better than the Steinbeck machine that <laughs> Thelma Shoemaker or whichever one of those legendary film editors from back in the day edited The Godfather. I don't know which one it was, so apologies. Uh, but, um, y you know, it, it's they have it all at their fingertips. Um all that is missing is the will. You know, everybody's always talking about funding. Well, I've written and directed 15 plays, which I also produced or co-produced, got them on in theatres, got them up on stage. You know, a lot of them were on the fringe. Most of those are profit share, and we all know what that means. You, normally, you know, you're not making any money, or if you're making any, you're getting very little. And as the director on that project, you're putting in a huge amount of time. You're putting in, you know, six to eight weeks before the actors even arrive, before the actors are even cast, sometimes longer. Um, but, you know, if you believe in it, you can make it happen. And um, I think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a changed school of thought, and I see this with young, people I did a talk recently in Birmingham at an acting school about 30 people in the class and some of these people couldn't have cared less about what I had to say to them <laughs> they there was this pervading attitude of I'm going to leave here and it's all going to happen for me and um, if I go and do a talk I'm, I'm very blunt and um, you know to the point of almost being rude you know, I, I, I'm very blunt because because the, the, this industry will not. Um, it's a brutal industry, you know. Especially, you know, once you're in a major institution and they love you, like the BBC, for example. Um, case in point being, um, oh God, the actress that was cast in that terrible Indiana Jones movie, the last one. That's just the dial of dog shit. Um, <laughs> I forget. And she's um, uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge. Phoebe Waller Bridge, yes. right? So there's a lot of people that go through what I call the institution institution chain. You go to Oxford or you go to Cambridge, you become part of Footlights, which is the dramatic society. That already has loads of connections to production companies with the BBC, Channel 4, etc. So you, by virtue of going through that educational system, you've already got a big foot in the door, okay? Um, and um, you're going to make those connections of those top tier people. You've got the actors that go to RADA. RADA um, is got an open door to all the best agents, the top 10 tiered agents in London. People like Cam, United, Independent, all of those. Troika before it imploded. Um, they've gone now. Um, and so those actors are guaranteed to be seen, at the very least, be seen by those agents. And usually what will happen is with the actors that come from RADA, they'll get taken on for a trial period of, uh, this used to be how it was in the early 2000s, for sort of like, you know, somewhere between six weeks and six months. And if they get work, they'll keep them. And if they don't, they get the boot. And um, But they're already in the door. So um, those top tier people, you know, the Benedict Cumberbatches of this world and people like that, I'm not saying they have it easy. I mean, these people, you know, they're talented. They do work very hard. Absolutely, they do. But there, there, there is this kind of the RADA set, 
you know, the people that went to the top drama schools, the people that went to Ravensbourne College used to be where everybody went that became a technician for the BBC, for example. And um, a lot of those opportunities and those connections aren't there ready made for people like myself. We have to knock on the front door. We can't go in the back door. And um, it's very hard to, to penetrate those institutions. The, the, the younger people of today, um, in some ways, there's more opportunities for them because diversity is, is a big thing. There's lots of schemes and stuff like this that didn't exist when I was um, coming through the ranks. Um, so there are, for example, you know, getting a job as a director on EastEnders um, in the 1980s was a very close shop. Now there are schemes you can apply to get on it. I, I've, I've applied myself. Um, one of my friends, um, Avril, um, uh, is on it and has become a very successful director. And she's done, was it Jonestown or Jamestown, that other BBC show? She's gone and done episodes of that in Budapest. And she's now had a quite a successful career as a director. But, you know, those opportunities are, it's a bun fight. You're going to be fighting over that stuff. So if you, you've got to be very driven and very passionate but also prepared to create your own work. I created and put on productions, like my second production, Sticks and Stones. We had a budget of 800 pounds. It was a three act play, cast of 22 people, three decades over Northern Ireland. There's a two minute gun battle at the end of the second act. It was nuts what I was trying to put on stage. I remember one of the reviewers who quite likes the play, saying even Nicholas Heitner from the National Theatre would probably wobble at trying to recreate Bloody Sunday on stage, something like this. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I might as well aim for the stars. And if I land on the moon, you know, that's not too bad. <laughs> so I would, I would always push the limits of theatre because I couldn't go and make films. So I was pushing the limits of what theatre could be without the help of an institution like the Royal Court. I tried to get on their writer's scheme. We could have a whole conversation about that. Um, and the National Theatre, you know, and I've tried. I've tried to get in there as well, but it's never quite happened. Um, so I went and I did plays anyway, and I did all these plays on my own. When I look at the stuff that I go and see on the fringe now, I've yet to meet like a mini Lance, like a, a someone in their 20s. I've gone and seen this play. And it might not be the best play I've ever seen, but they've proper gone for it. They've, they've, they've tried to do things well beyond the means that, you know, a limited budget on a fringe production would try and do. Um, I have seen some amazing plays on the fringe, but, you know, they're all kind of four people talking heads and they're usually really good because the script's amazing. And that's fine. And mo that's most of fringe theatre. But I always tried to do stuff that was, I always really pushed it. And um, I, I did stuff that you would, you know, topics and subjects that should have been handled by the National or the Tricycle, now the Kiln Theatre. We would put them on at Jackson's Lane or wherever. I don't see, I don't see a, another person like me trying to do that. And I think the perception of the youth now is that's only possible with money. That's only possible with funding. So if I can't get the funding for it, I shouldn't do it. And... There's a caveat to that, which is, yes, you should always be paid for your work. Absolutely. As an actor, as a writer, as a director, you should always be paid for your work. But a lot of people only get work and become great directors if they do a couple of low budget or no budget things first. And I think that's a conversation that has to be, it's a collaboration that happens with the whole team. This You'll see this discussed in forums all the time. Should actors take unpaid work? Should actors do unpaid jobs and the answer to that question is you should evaluate each job on its own merit what commitments do you have going on in your life at the time how much do you value the team that are doing this project are this team going to look after you do they value your time are they showing you that they value your time what are you going to get out of it um, when are you going to get at that, that out of it you're getting a scene for your showreel when are you going to get it what's the firm timeline of the production so it isn't a yes or no question. It's an evaluate each project on a case by case basis. And if something's worth doing and it's going to be good for you 
acting is a muscle. You've, it's like going down the gym. So the more you do it, the better. You should never be sitting on your ass. I think in the in the the, the people coming up now in their eight, sort of teenagers and in their twenties, and I'm, I am generalising a bit here, but from what I've seen, the pervading attitude is, oh, it's just going to happen for me. You know, I'll go to drama school, I'll come out and I'll get a job. And it's it's not like that. In fact, because although there's more content out there, a lot of the people that have got where they are um, have done it by creating their own content. Um, you know, there are, I can think of two or three YouTubers that ended up getting shows with Netflix or Amazon or whatever because they did some sort of comedy podcast first coming into this business you've got to be realistic you need to understand one it is a business that if if i could go back in time and tell my younger self anything that is the number one thing i would say to myself lance it's a business how are you going to make money out of this project understand it's a business and i should have had a lot of conversations with myself about the journey with that before i started making that film or should i should have done a different film first um, number two, you've got to create your own content. You can't wait because let's say 30 actors graduate from a drama school, okay? Um, and let's say of those 30 actors, maybe five of them get picked up by an agent after their showcase. And of those five agents, one of those agents is really good. So one of those 30 people, and again, I am generalizing, but I'm just giving an example might have a good chance, might have a good chance of a career because they've got a good agent looking after them and presumably they got the good agent because the agent saw they were talented. So you've got 20 other nine people that were on that course now wondering what they're going to do. Um, and what they should be doing is looking to create opportunities um, outside of just having an agent. And how do I do that? Well, I've got to, I've got to have a really good showreel. How do I make sure I've got a really good showreel? I haven't been in anything yet. Well, you've got to get together with four other of your friends who are on that course and you've got to say, okay, we're all going to put in a bit of money each. We're going to write four scenes between us. We're going to shoot two scenes per day over a long weekend. You're going to be the cameraman on that scene. You two are going to be in scene one. Me and this guy are going to be in scene two. And between the four of us, we're going to make it and we'll get a couple of our friends and relatives to help. My mum will make the sandwiches, you know. That's how you start. And then at the end of that weekend, boom, there are four scenes. Mm. You know, now these four actors have got four scenes. Maybe they've got two scenes each, you know, and they helped shoot the other scenes. It's about collaboration. You collaborate, you make content, um, and that content gives you a higher profile, more content for your showreel, shows people what you can do. Um, it's a showcase for your talent. And then you mm. keep doing that until something happens but you've got to be passionate about it i've been in this industry a really long time uh full time since certainly full time since 97 hmm. i've had some of the best times of my life in this industry and i absolutely have definitely had some of the worst times how do you how do you deal with rejection and with projects not going through and just to... <laughs> Um, re re I've never had a problem with rejection. Um, that's, I think, as a writer director, I accept that I'm in a small pond with a lot of other people. There's a limited amount of work, so rejection in the in in, in the sense of rejection letters, auditions I didn't get when I was trying to make it as an actor, that kind of stuff. That sort of stuff stopped bothering me quite early on. I know for some people it's a, it's really difficult. And it's quite a big deal. What I do have a problem with is when you get screwed over by um, unscrupulous individuals in the industry who falsely represent who they are and falsely represent what they can achieve. For some people in the industry, this will be agents who are not very good or who are very late at paying the fees that they're due to pay their actors, stuff like that. For filmmakers, it's often producers. Um, you know, how many producers does it take to change a light bulb? Change it yourself, it's faster. Um, it, you know, it, it, there are great producers out there, but the great producers out there are usually already attached to very well-known production companies and they're constantly working and they care about the, the, the stuff that they want to make. Um, Nicola Gregory 
is a good example of of one of the up and coming exceptionally gifted uh, producers working today in the UK and she's Canadian so we're, we're lucky to have her over here um, I'm going to be interviewing Gail Ann Hurd on my YouTube channel she's one of the best producers ever to have lived responsible for some of the best uh, feature films we've ever seen Terminator you know um, The Abyss um, Aliens mm. but then unfortunately the indie film world the independent film world is populated by a huge number of bullshitters. And don't get me wrong, everybody is bullshitting in this industry to some degree. You have to bullshit because you've always got to pretend to be more confident than you are. And that's the same for actors. You know, you've got to pretend, acting is pretending. Trying to sell a project, pitching a project is pretending that it's the best project ever, whether you believe it is or not. You've got to convince the people that might put money into it that it is the best project ever. But there are producers who pretend that they can deliver you the world where in reality they can deliver you absolutely nothing. They have no contacts, no weight of any kind in the industry. And their sole objective is to get the biggest slice of the pie possible by doing the most little that they can get away with. I've met people like that. I've worked with people like that. And I've been fucked over by people like that. That is a lot harder. Um, and especially in the case of one particular project which you know if it had been another horror film um not that you know any project of itself is always important but um when you're doing a historical drama which is a true story where the the families and relatives of all the people in this drama are still alive and, and some of the people you're going to depict in the drama are still alive and it's very important to these people that not only that the film happens but the story is told in the right way and they have great expectations that as a f that type of project as a filmmaker comes with a huge level of responsibility just like when i did the play about the the post office scandal that came with a huge burden of responsibility to get it right for the the victims of that that scandal so when a project like that with that level of responsibility goes under or goes tits up because of the actions of others that's outside of your control. As a filmmaker, that can absolutely break and destroy you. And, and that happened to me um, on a project that I started working on in the summer of, well, we were first talking about it in 2014. I wrote the script in 2015. We'd scouted everything and were ready to go. The expectation was we would shoot in 2017 and the project would be out for the 75th anniversary of this particular event. And that you can't, couldn't have bought that kind of publicity. I mean, this film would have made loads of money for everybody concerned, you know. And, uh, and it didn't happen. Um, and uh, it was going to be the project that was going to take my career from here to here. It was this World War II historical epic film. And it had a massive social media following. We had 35,000 followers on our Facebook page without even trying, without even getting a PR company involved or anything like that. That was all going to come later. So uh, there was already this huge following. So when that film went tits up, you know, it was me that was in the firing line. It was my name all over it. It was my baby. And I placed my trust in people. Um you know, that I thought were passionate about making films. And it turns out that they weren't. They were just awful human beings. And uh, the worst thing about that whole experience was that one of the people that screwed us over was one of my own guys who was in on it quite early on. And we, we later found out, you know, we had proof that this guy was in on it. And um, I won't ever speak to him again. You know, I, I never uh, just... And, and this put... this. Normally when a project like that collapses, you kind of, you know, you lick your wounds, you, you feel a bit shit for a while and you move on. But this, this project didn't end that way. Um, this project had massive ramifications. Not only were the relatives all very angry and I had to address that and speak to them all individually, which, took, which was a process. And some of them are still angry, you know. But there were also 
cast and crew that we, we had all attached and lined mm -hmm. up. And when a project doesn't happen, that reflects badly on you as a filmmaker. And when you try and attach people for the next project, it becomes harder. Um, so, it, it, you know, there's, a, that, there's reputational damage that comes with it. Then the other thing that happened on top of that was because this was the big movie, lots of people have helped me out in my career um, early on. I've had various friends who were in higher echelons, Jason Fleming being one, that did favours for me. And another person who did a lot of favours for me was a special effects VFX guy called um, Alan Marks, late great Alan Marks. And he was one of the first you know, when CGI became a thing, he was right at the forefront of CGI in the UK. And he worked on um, Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct. He did all the CGI uh, visual effects for that. And an uh, exceptionally talented man, and he'd already budgeted all the effects for the film. You know, he did some work on it. And his paycheck on that film would have been about 75 grand. Um, and in, t I think it was 2019, or, or 2018, the film kind of went, we knew in December of 2017, we found out what was going on. So 2018 was all about running around, trying to find the money for the movie when we realized it wasn't gonna happen. Then these guys hung on to the rights deliberately, so we couldn't make it with anyone else. And they, they did that until 2019. And then we found out all these other horror stories about people that had worked with these guys. One guy tried to kill himself, another one's in a mental institution. Um, you know, uh, the, the damage that they've left in their wake is absolutely appalling, absolutely appalling people. They, you know, they shouldn't be, be let anywhere near a film set and they corrupt people around them as well, you know. Did he try to deliberately stop the movie or like what? No, what they did was um, they get their hooks into you, they get you to sign a contract. Um, so they were going to get 9% of the budget. There were three of them, whether they raise the money or not. The guy whose job it was to look over the contract, who was the guy with a bit of business acumen on my team, was the guy that fucked us over. They got their hooks into him very early on. I don't want to go into all the details. And um, I went and found the finance for the film. I got a person involved. Mm. We were all about to sign the contracts. And then what happened was, behind closed doors, they said to that investor who was going to bring all the money in, don't invest in this film. Invest in this film over here. And the, the film over there, which did get made, has never been seen. On that film, and I can quote these figures because I've had somebody who, on the budget of that film contact me because they wanted to take them to court. These two guys, because they fucked over the third one, because, you know, no honour among thieves, <laughs> they paid themselves 750 grand each for their producer's fees on this film that had a three and a half million pound budget, right? So that's 1.5 million right there. With their expenses, it came to 2.1 million. So they took 2.1 million of the budget of that film for basically doing nothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they've done this before. They, they did this to another filmmaker and, you know, he's gone through absolutely horrendous experience. And like I said, the one guy that I spoke to who'd worked with them when I called him up, he just broke down crying to me on the phone. Had a, he had a, a mental breakdown on the phone and I, I was like, I'm so sorry. And he's like, oh, it took ages for me to put all this behind me. I left the industry because of it. I never wanted to make another film again. That's what these guys did to these people, you know? So um, those are the people you've got to be really wary of. And, and re you know, rejection is neither here nor there. Sorry, we're not going to make the show with you. I had a show that, that went all the way to the top of Amazon in I think it was 23 or 22 might have been 22 and everybody said it was going to be a yes it was about a corrupt British policeman everybody loved it it's one of the best pilots I've ever written and co-wrote it uh, with my friend Craig Fairbrass and the week that we were waiting for the decision to happen was the week that that woman got kidnapped by that policeman and murdered on Clapham Common in lockdown so i think it must have actually been 29 it must have been the summer of 21 i think or 2021 because this was still covid was still a thing yeah that policeman wayne cousins i guess i think his name was awful awful story you know took that woman off the streets and murdered her just appalling thing but of course at the time we had this project waiting to be greenlit that was about a corrupt british policeman mm. 
That project was dead overnight. No one wanted to touch it. And I was like, it, it was dead overnight for the right reasons. Absolutely the right reasons. But, you know, you're, you're, you're that close, mm -hmm. getting your name as co-creator on a TV show for Amazon, six-part drama series. You're the, you're the lead writer. You're going to be heading up the writing team. You're going to write most of the scripts. I'd already written, I think, half of them anyway. Um, and then it doesn't happen. And I was like, oh, you know, I could tell you 10 other of those so near yet so far stories. Now, they're hard. But, you know, in a few couple of weeks go by and it's like you get back on the horse and you're at it again with another project or you're approaching someone else. That's very different from working on a project for three years with your own team where these people come along and they not only do they screw you over, they also poison your own team. They were, they were you know, at one point they were going to try and get me kicked off the film. I know because I got CC'd into an email chain that they accidentally sent me. Oh, dear. Um, you know, so it, it, it's a business with some really horrible people in it. But uh, basically, your very last and very quick sum up for people who want to be writers in the industry, why and how you should do it if you want to do it. Don't and, do it. Don't and, do it. And why you don't want to do um, it. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, look, I, I, I love telling stories. I like taking people on that journey but why do it you've got to be really passionate about it um you've got to have some talent but you're going to learn the the, the the journey of doing anything creative half the fun is learning stuff you know um discovering new ways of doing things building on the talent you've got expanding it shaping it um but uh, you've got to do it because you love it. It's not just, I mean, I'm not just a writer. I'm an acting coach. I'm a director. I like directing more than anything. And that's the thing I probably get to do the least of at the moment. You have to have a tough skin. You need to be prepared. You've got to have other, you've got to have other, you've got to have backups. You've got to have other income streams. You've got to have other revenue streams. You've got to have a fallback. I wouldn't have stayed in the industry if I hadn't loved what I do so much because I'm not a financial success story. Um, I mean, if anybody wants to look at a really good model of how you should make independent films, one person that I really admire, I've had him on my channel for an interview, great guest, I'm going to be getting him back on again this year, is, is film director Howard Ford. He's like a one-man army. I mean, he doesn't do it all on his own, but his first feature film, he was, it was like him and two crew, you know, it was called the adventure boys um his his stuff is he has a strong concept packages it really well goes to a foreign location keeps the shoot really tight he knows exactly what he's making he knows the market he's selling to and i think he's now got a track record with his his investors so they come back and they invest in the next film um i admire howard so much he's he's got a really good work e ethic and he's got a really good um, sense of what he's doing with his films and his products and he knows his market and he knows who he is. I really want to talk about Paratrooper as well but we'd really we just really well <laughs> it's it's the European band of brothers but it's yeah. about the Polish the it's about the Polish the British there's a German episode um, and it's you know it, it wouldn't cost anywhere near the amount of band of brothers to shoot because of the way I'm going to shoot it um but is it a, still in the works is it still well uh, funnily enough i mean i because i've learned not to like shout out about projects until they're happening yeah i've i've made that mistake before gone very public with a project i think is going to happen and then it doesn't happen and so that the public perception is oh that's another film that lance tried to get made that didn't get made so um ever since we we first started working on it and the first attempt to make it didn't happen there's been 10 since then and there's been 10 that have gone all the way right to the point of, are we getting funding or not? And the last one of those was this year. It was in May. And it looked like it was going to happen. Looked like maybe we were going to get the funding to do the, the pilot, finish the pilot. Not, not the whole series, but the, get the, the pilot made as a feature film. And then if that did well, this studio was going to 
fund the rest. And it was put to a vote and it, it didn't get it. Didn't get it. It was another, it was another no. And it was like, at, thi at this point, and my friend um, who's got a very successful YouTube channel, The Critical Drinker, he was instrumental. We all heard about him. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, I, I know him outside of YouTube and I, I wrote to him very, very early on and, and mm -hmm. I'm, I was also his first moderator on his channel. By oh, the way. Really? Yeah. Um, so Will has become a really good friend of mine and uh, he's been on my channel a number of times. In fact, he's, he's largely... You know, he's very key. He's very key in me doing the whole YouTube thing. He's largely responsible for me doing what I'm doing with my channel. Um, and I'm eternally. He's another one like Jason Fleming. I'm a, I'm eternally grateful to him for that. He's the Jason Fleming of the YouTube world. <laughs> is Will Jordan? So um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, he he tried to help me get the latest attempt of paratrooper, and, and that that wouldn't have even happened without him. He was very key in in us getting to that stage where it nearly got the green light and then it didn't and um so you know projects that are in, de in, in development are always in development it's it's like and i've just i've learned not to shout out about what we're doing on social media until the money's in the bank yep so that project has gone through more near misses than any other film or show i've ever worked on I still think there's an audience for it. I still think it's a very uh, yeah. commercial show if done properly. And I think it would be a huge hit, not just on streaming, but I think if you did a really good physical media package. Mm. The Band of Brothers box set, which is sitting over there behind the monitor, is the biggest selling DVD set worldwide in physical media history. Can you imagine? I I only finally watched it in March. God, God, <laughs> we we did that. We did an amazing breakdown of it on my YouTube channel. You can see it, it's all there under a playlist called "Chew the Fat," and we had um, the inside man who worked on the show the whole way through, mm -hmm. um, and he was on every episode. So he had behind the scenes stills nice. that no one had ever seen, and. Nice. Look, I, I'm pretty sure we we're gonna have to do got like, another one of those with you, maybe at some point, because we covered the. We, we, know, we, like, there is so much stuff that we still have haven't covered. Like, I still have like I have a lot of questions, but you know what? Let's let's finish today on somewhat positive note. Yeah. Let's do the blitz round let's and let's that. agree on the fact that we might do another episode with you maybe like in a few months maybe there will be another some project that um, um, we will be able to talk about and we'll talk about more of you know your your life well, i've got a couple of new books coming out so yeah. and we haven't even talked about those and yeah. Uh, so yeah we can we can do a stream on that if you want next time i think let's do it again but today go for it so texting or talking talking cats or dogs dogs your one guilty pleasure uh Chuck Norris, Invasion USA. <laughs> what makes you laugh? Um, being in the company of my friends. And what makes you angry? Uh, getting fucked over on movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Being, uh, being betrayed by my friends. Yeah, that will do it. That yeah. will do it. Do you have any nicknames? If I do, people haven't told me. Which dish do you cook best? Oh, anything Italian. I um, I love pasta, but I've tried to cut down because of my tum tum. Your favorite character in any fictional story? I mean, I've got so many, but Lord of the Rings, Aragorn. All right, great, great, <laughs> great arc, great hero. Just yeah. Well, the next question is the Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings? Oh God! Uh, well, I mean, they've both been ruined as IPs now, unfortunately, by recent content. But um, <laughs> Best trilogy of all time, I've probably got to give it to Lord of the Rings because um, Return of the Jedi kind of screwed up a bit with the Ewoks, so I'd probably give it... <laughs> Lord of the Rings is the perfect trilogy. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? <sighs> um, I can't. I can't pick one. Okay. Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? Uh, <laughs> I, I do. Probably can't talk about them on camera. Um... <laughs> Oh, I paint um, miniatures. Oh, nice. So, nice. yeah. Um, Is it just, just like any or Warhammer or like... No, yeah. oh, well, funny enough, I did play Warhammer briefly when I was younger, but uh, World War Two. 
So, no. yeah, mainly. Nice. Spaceships. Uh, so I've got some in the other room. I'll show you before you go. How <laughs> do cray? Oh, recently quite a lot. Mm. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. Re yeah, in recent times, quite a bit. More than I should. Mm. And how can people reach you if they want to work with you? So I'm available for one-to-one -one acting coaching, script writing, script editing, consultations, anything to do with story, all of that stuff. Um, uh, direct freelance director, of course, always interested even in fringe productions. Um, your best way to get hold of me is either via Twitter, which is Lance Nielsen WD uh, or X. I can't, still can't get into the habit <laughs> calling it X. I've got a Facebook page, which is a work page, Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen on Facebook. And the last segment is one cool thing is something that you really like and you think that our viewers and listeners should try to. Right. So go on to YouTube and search for this. The Leaf People Together in Electric Dreams. So in the lockdown, you know, we were doing all this stuff with YouTube and performing and stuff, and you can see it on the Outcast Creative YouTube channel. Please do subscribe. I'd love to get some more subscribers. Um, one of the things that we were doing was I was playing songs for my cast to warm up, and one of my favourite songs of all time is to Together in Electric Dreams by Giorgio Moroder, which was number one in... I think it was 1984. Uh, it, it came with a film of the same name. The film's not that good, but the, the song's amazing. And I came across this, The Leaf People Do Together in Electric Dreams. And it's a band who, I think they're from Horsham or something. And um, they did, they, they started doing songs, they would perform them live in their separate homes. Mm. So you've got four guys in four separate recording studios doing this performance of Together in Electric Dreams. And I have to say, it's my favourite version of the song ever. Now, they've got a comedy gag that happens in the middle of the song. So, Leaf People, if you're watching this, because uh, you know how much I love that song, because I'm always posting under it. On, <laughs> I would love them to do that again, but without the gag. Um, and the gag is very funny. My cast laughed when it happened. I don't want to tell people what it is. <laughs> But yeah, that was one of the best things I ever saw on YouTube in lockdown. And I've also ripped it and it's on my iPod. <laughs> so I listen to it when I'm out on the tube, the Leaf People's version of Electric Dreams, my favorite version of that song. And it's, it's just like quite heartwarming to see some people doing something like that in lockdown, which was a very difficult time. And mm. we were doing our creative thing and they did a few songs and I was seeing them doing their creative thing. And I was like, yeah, these are the kind of people I like to go down the pub with. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And uh, guys, if you liked this interview, like, subscribe, and go and check uh, Lance's channel, The Outcast Creative. Outcast Creative. YouTube. Yeah. Subscribe today. Bye, guys.